that is quite an affirmation that we boldly declare and we need to think seriously about it when we say where he leads I will follow and follow every day it's easy to say that a little harder to understand just what that means in my life and the decisions I make the things I do and don't do and then to be steadfast, unmovable in the doing of it. Just very quickly, of course it means we do only as our sovereign king authorizes in his word for us to do. Colossians 3.17. That means we apply it to in ourselves individually, the church collectively, to each husband and wife, to each father and mother, because we're to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. We're to live in the world, in a body prepared for this world, but we're out of the world in the way we think, in our perspectives, our views, our goals, our desires. That is, if we're really Christians, we know this life's going to come to an end. Brother Ken said a while ago, if we put our hopes only in this world, surely what's happened and is happening to this world ought to say all of that's going to come to naught. And you know, even if everything went just like we wanted, as we tend to say sometimes, it is still appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. So we shall not always live in this body, in this world, with things functioning as they now function. So when we sing a song, where he leads I'll follow, and that I'll follow all the way and every day. And that's a bold assertion and affirmation, but it's the right one. It's the one we ought to make, but we ought to know what it implies about our thinking, saying, and doing, who we do it with and where, and where we're really loyal and to whom we're loyal. In settling on the sermon today, I really had two sermons in mind. And I brought both of them because I really didn't make up my mind until a little bit ago. I decided to preach one of them earlier in the week. And then in doing writing almost every day for an article, things just kept developing. So I said, because they're connected. They're connected. You'll see that. I decided to do one of them this afternoon and go ahead and do the one I planned this morning. Now, if you read the bulletin, you may find when you read it that this one that I'm giving this morning is going to be familiar if you listen to what I say, because it's an article that I wrote quite some years ago, and it's been picked up and used hither and yon, and I was reminded of it because somebody else picked it up last week, and it showed up on the internet, and I said, yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> My view is if it was worth preaching once, or if it was worth writing, and what motivated me to preach or write it, then it's, it's worth it again. I call it simply mark and avoid. Mark and avoid. This afternoon's sermon, which may stretch over to next week, really will serve to give even more background to what I say this morning. But I think it ought to be uh, taught more on and more time given to it than just this one. And I hope what I have to say, if the Lord wills that I'm here to say it, will back up more what I say this morning from God's Word. None of it's new to students of the Bible, not a thing. Maybe some of the emphasis will be. But there can be no doubt to the student of God's Word that Christians are commanded of God to mark and avoid certain members of the church. Underscore the word certain. When such is necessary. And underscore the word necessary or called for. However, and in general, the churches have chosen to ignore this command and they will pay the price for their sin of omission. Not only at the final judgment, but in this life as well regarding the church being as God wants it to be. I know that because of the law of sowing and reaping, Galatians 6 and verse 7. No one reaps what he does not sow. 
Paul in that passage says, if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But the one that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now that gets my attention. Always has all my life. Because what it's teaching is if I live solely, as I said in the beginning, for the here and now on the level of the flesh and the material things, that sort of all pass away. It's corruptible. It won't last. And I'll go with it in the sense of eternal salvation. I will not have it. On the other hand, if I sow to the Spirit, if I live according to spiritual things as taught to me by the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, as the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, leads and guides and directs me, and I set my affections on things above, in that I set my affections on doing God's will and seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, then I shall reap, no doubt about it, so will anybody else who does it, life everlasting. That's a promise. And we sing about God's promises. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Sweeter far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ. Sinless was he. He the great example is and pattern for me. Christ came as a man, but he was God coming as a man, and he showed men how to live as men. Do you remember the mechanic, and some of you will, in the TV advertisement of some years ago, and it was popular then, and everybody knew about it. And I can't remember how long ago that was. But anyway, he holds an oil filter in his hand. And he says, pay me now or pay me later. In other words, an internal combustion engine works certain ways, and it needs uh, tending to. And that oil filter is an important point. Of course, they're selling an oil filter. The idea is $3 for a filter now, or if you don't pay any attention to that oil, how clean it is and what it's supposed to do, you don't have to pay me that $3 for that filter. But you can pay me $1,200 probably or more for a new motor later, or however much it would cost. Now, that's common sense to us. We know that when you get something, you have to take care of it. Ignoring God's law of marking and avoiding is a sin of omission. It's not pleasant. There's nothing pleasant about it. For Christians to mark and avoid those who need it. And things unpleasant to us, very easy for us to just, well, we'll get around to it maybe. I know that's the way it is because a number of people are ill and won't go to the doctor to get help. You don't want to face the music. You don't want to face what they say. Uh, maybe it's trying to get your taxes done before April 15th, and so you put it off and you put it off and you put it off. It's unpleasant. We are prone that way. It's something we need to learn about ourselves. Humans don't like to jump right in the middle of that which is unpleasant and hurtful. We don't like to. It's very easy, so we do it. It's, it's entertaining to it, so we do it. It's pleasant to us, so we do it. When you neglect what God said is obligatory upon us, then there's an immediate, in this case, reality of sinning against God by refusing to remedy a serious problem as God directed. Having omitted what God commanded, then this permits the evil leavening of a sinful member or members, as the case may be, to influence through that sitting person's life who will not correct his or her life, or by the false doctrine they teach to further infect the church. Thus, putting off something like this makes the problem even greater and detrimental to everybody. We would not, I don't think, do that to our physical bodies. Uh, to make a point on this again, graphically, you don't see a person whose arms cut off and blood spurting saying, I think I'll wait till tomorrow to go to the emergency room. They don't do that. Or people that are just not feeling very good at all and they're just 
don't they're not themselves physically and and it just keeps on and on and it doesn't let up and you finally go to the doctor and you get bad news about some dire or something wrong with you people don't like that which is unpleasant or hurtful but under given circumstances they will take care of it or do the best they can in that case well that's the physical body what about the spiritual body of Christ of which we are members in particular does God not care about that body we took the Lord's Supper a moment ago we sang a song saying I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he goes that's good if we'll do it but when we partook of the Lord's Supper, if we did it right, we remember the agony, suffering, and shame that Christ took upon Himself when He didn't have to. And it was all for you and for me. Blood was shed for the remission of man's sins. It purchased the church. Any person who's believed in Christ, repented of sins, and confessed one's faith in Christ, when that person is baptized into Christ, that person contacts the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross. In the watery grave of baptism, you're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And it's in his death he shed his blood, and that's where the blood's applied. And it cleanses us from all sins. John tells us if we live faithful, walking the light as he's in the light, that blood that we contacted in the waters of baptism continues to cleanse us from all sins. What an assurance and a wonderful thing that is that there's such a system out there that though you sin as Paul did and he called himself chief of sinners, when you will from the heart obey the gospel and live righteous, all those sins are taken away. It involves belief based upon the word of God that Christ is the Son of God and a resolve to follow Him so there's repentance turning away from every way that's contrary to His will and determined to follow His way in all things as we sang in the song. A willingness to before men to confess your faith in him, no matter the consequences, and then to complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized for the remission of sins. To have the blood applied, to be forgiven, to be cleansed from sins, to have those sins never held against you again, and to live a faithful life with the blood cleansing. So when people determine to go contrary to the truth, refusing to repent, then God's concerned about those people in the spiritual body just like you would be concerned, I say just like, at least like, you would be concerned about some alien part of your body. You know, there's a time before medicines, gangrene set in. You think of the Civil War, think of the people wounded. All they could do is when they recognized that gangrene was in a limb, is cut it off. When you look at the Lord's teaching, He has a remedy. For everything. Problem is, we talk about faith in Him and trust in Him and I'll follow Him all the way. Those are easy words. But not always are they easy. It wasn't easy for Christ to go to the cross. Suffer as He did and die. So the Bible commands us to mark evil people, impenitent people. And later, we'll see that we are to mark faithful brethren as well. So this is not just a lesson about saying, here's a person in the church who's hurting the church by life and or doctrine. The person won't repent. The person won't change. We've done all we know to do. Thus, we have to say, no company with that person. But there are people that we want to point out and mark them because they're the kind of people everybody ought to be. They are godly patterns of life. They've proven over the years they're godly. We want to mark them too. And say, look at that man. Look at that woman. You want to see how a Christian lives? You want to see how you put to practice the things of the New Testament? Look at their lives. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul wrote the church at Rome, warning them, saying, Now I beseech you. But look how he does it. I've said this many times, and you know it. The word beseech is not used much in English today. But it's, it's down on your knees begging somebody. Sometimes we see... Somebody wanting to ask somebody else to marry them, a man asking a woman to marry them. And we see various stages of the way they go about it to make a sensation out of it. But have you ever noticed that even this day and age, most of the time, the man gets down on his knees and asks the woman to marry him? 
What does that mean? It's a demonstration by posture of your seriousness, of your sobriety, of it's very important to you. So he says, now I beseech you. And he says, brethren, you're my brethren in the Lord. We've all heard and obeyed the gospel. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Or the American standard says the innocent. Again, Romans 16, 17, 18. Now, let's look at this a little closer. The word mark translates the Greek word skope. It means to look at, to behold, to watch, to contemplate. It's used metaphorically of looking to. In Romans 16, 17, warning against those who cause divisions. In Philippians 3 and verse 17, of observing those, as I said earlier, who walk faithfully in order according to the law of God, that Christians might have a pattern or an example after which to conduct their lives. In Luke 11, 35, scopeo is rendered into English, take heed. Same thing as take note of or mark. We might say sometimes, watch the corner of that cabinet and don't bunch your, bump your head. Well, he didn't say watch the car out in the street. You mark the problem where he was and what he's apt to bump his head into because of where he is and what he's doing. That's marking it. The word avoid is translated from the Greek word eklino. It means to turn away from, to turn aside. Turning away from those who cause offenses and occasions of stumbling according to the doctrine. Turning away from division makers and errors. Now, it did not say from all those who cause division, but those who cause division when they go contrary to the teaching. The Lord calls all sorts of division. You have to recognize there is an authorized division and there is an unauthorized division. We do not want to be involved in causing a division that's not authorized. The Lord said himself... Uh, the mother of me against her daughter-in-law. and so Well, that's division. But it was all over the truth. They wouldn't compromise the truth, so some people would not have anything to do with it. Well, that's division. But they're talking about, or Paul is here, division that comes by somebody injecting false doctrine. They're instrumental in putting it in themselves or in a life they're living or both. We're to stay away from them. We're to stay out of their way so that we will not fall in with them in their evil work. We're to have nothing to do with them that would cause us to be influenced by them, except that when we rebuke them and refute any errors they may teach, we have the New Testament full of that. When Paul first heard the doctrine that came from Jerusalem that you Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to do it. Acts 15, 1 and 2 says they didn't hold off. They dealt with them right there in um, the Gentile church, Antioch of Syria. He relates to this in Galatians 2 and 5. We didn't even give a half hour to go by before we dealt with that false doctrine in the church. You look at 11, it even pulled Peter and Barnabas, great men as they were, and he had to withstand Peter to the face for he was to be blamed. You see various places. Jude 3, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, as you preach the word, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. If the divine admonition does not mean we are to mark them for the error they teach or the bad life they're living or both and completely avoid them. Now let me ask you, think with me. What words would inspiration employ to say as much? The reason, I think, is very obvious. When the contentious, the factious, and or the false teacher is left to himself by faithful brethren, that person will soon have nobody with which to fuss but himself. And his sinful influence is cut off from the congregation. Remember your physical body? Some of us get older... Spots show up, you begin to wonder, is that skin cancer? Is it pre-skin cancer? 
do you take note of your body? I mean, do you take care of your physical body? It's all you've got to stay in this world. Are you mindful of it? Do you ever have physicals? Well, then move over to the spiritual body with the head Christ. We are, as members of his spiritual body, the church, the family of God, his hands. We are his feet. We are his mouth on this earth. We are commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel, God's power to save, to every creature. Mark 16, 15, Romans 1, 16. We are commanded to live right lives exemplary of godliness. Let your light so shine that all the world may see your good works and glorify God in this behalf. The church had not existed very long before false teachers reared their ugly heads in it. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Acts 15.1. Now what will they do about that? I've already mentioned that. Faithful brethren, such as Paul, called them false brethren in Galatians 2.4. And he writes that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage, into bondage. Well, in fact, the book of Galatians and the letter, the second Corinthian epistle, were written in part to counteract this cancerous doctrine. They were working for their own sensual ends. Paul said, as we read earlier, they served their own belly. In their own misguided zeal, they would travel to Rome or anywhere else they could to spread their false doctrine among the churches. This they would do through their smooth and fair speech. Their goal being to beguile the hearts of the innocent. Inspiration said that. Jesus warned us. He said that's what would happen. As the New Testament was being written and apostles walked this earth and miraculous gifts were here, this is what they wrote. Therefore, Paul ordered the church to oppose them boldly and without hesitation, using strong and sharp words where necessary in opposition of their nefarious era, so that the church would know the false teachers the false doctrine and that it was false and know them for what they were and recognize the doctrine they taught was evil and contrary to the doctrine of Christ. The first passages we considered in this study primarily dealt with false teachers. But one can walk disorderly without teaching a false doctrine. They can be affirming everything about the Bible to be true. That doesn't mean they brought their life in subjection to it, to it or willing to obey it. Now that being the case, question, what should be done with those who otherwise walk disorderly? Well, Paul doesn't leave us without an answer. In other words, Jesus has told us. Paul wrote, for we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. 2 Thessalonians 3.11. When you read that, what do you think? Well, this doesn't apply to us. Verse 14 gives the answer. And if any man obey not our, uh, our word by this epistle, here's your marking again. Note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. For well, God forbid we could make anybody ashamed of his sinful conduct. But that's the process of converting him. You realize if you're a child of God and you've reached the stage in how you're living, wrong living, or what you're teaching, false doctrine, that you can't be made ashamed of it, you're going to hell. The Bible says you've got to make them ashamed of their actions. You ever tell your children you ought to be ashamed of yourself? What do you mean when you said that? There's a code to live by, you've been taught it, and you know better than that. You ever tell them that? And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. What about children of God and the family of God, the church? Disorderly translates the Greek word autoktos. It's a military term. It means not keeping rank. It means insubordinate. That's the word the Holy Spirit had Paul use in writing the church about such folks. You know, the church is the army of the Lord. Such church members, soldiers in the army of the Lord, are out of step with the doctrine of Christ in their teaching and or living. They're not following Jesus, the captain of their salvation, Hebrews 2.10. They must be brought to repentance or, if not, they won't repent, or avoided by faithful brethren, 
as I said, if they refuse to repent. Those brethren who refuse to have no company with him also commit sin if they don't do it. In other words, if they're commanded to have no company with him, but they go ahead and do it anyway, are they walking as the Lord would teach them to walk? Thus, by their unauthorized actions, they too are out of step with the will of heaven. They're not keeping rank. Colossians 3.17, they too need corrective church discipline. I just don't understand why when we know that every facet of our life on this earth demands discipline, but the church, just let it do what it wants to, and then we stand back and say, can't you figure this out? Regardless of whether a church member is a false teacher or a church member who walks disorderly in some other way or one who has chosen to sever fellowship from faithful brethren, the action is the same. We must know, mark, and avoid them. Marking starts with the public declaration of their sin. Avoiding is how we react toward them in the days that follow. Both of these take great faith in and love of God and how God says things are accomplished if they're to be accomplished. Thus we need courage to act. But you've already said, haven't you? Where he leads, I will follow. Now I said more, and I've even touched on it about marking the good ones. In Philippians 3.17, Paul writes, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. In this passage, Mark means to fix one's attention on. And it's used to teach the brethren to imitate Paul in his conduct. In Romans 16, 17, the word Mark's used so faithful brethren will be able to identify the troublemaker and avoid them. But in Philippians 3, Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me. Every one of us ought to be living our lives every day. Remember, we're to follow Jesus every day. We said we would, didn't we? So that people can look at us and say, that's the way I need to live my life. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he adds, also, or as I also am of Christ. In other words, you're living according to the truth. You're applying the Bible to your life and what you do and don't do and what you choose. Christians are to pick out men and women in the church who are worthy of imitation and make note of them. We're to mark those good examples for our encouragement. It's regrettable. But some brethren focus on the failures of some brethren rather than the faithful conduct of godly brethren. And so, you know, the old saying goes when you're having Sunday dinner, you have chicken and preacher to pick the bones of. Well, that's just an example of getting at the person who teaches you God's will because you can't get it God. We do know one time they were able to get it God and they nailed him to a cross. It is as if they chose to focus on Judas Iscariot rather than the apostle Paul in their own service to Jesus. There's always going to be weak people in the congregation, large or small. But there'll be strong people too. And when you're training your children, who do you tell them to look to? The fellow that shows up at service once every six weeks or whenever it moves him? Or the person that's there, faithfully involved in everything? There's your example. There's your pattern. Let's remember the advice of the psalmist. Listen. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. Psalm 37, verse 37. Now you take that in view of everything else we've studied and all that we won't bring out today that deals with that, and you will see why we must be godly examples. What keeps us from obeying the Lord's command to mark good men among the saints, to be our examples among men so they can follow Him? Well, the answer is found in that all too often our values are misplaced. <laughs> What keeps us from obeying the Lord's command to mark and avoid wicked brethren? Well, again, it's saying one thing, but puts us on the spot to do that. Sometimes relatives are involved, brotherhood projects that everybody's involved in, where the money comes from to fund such endeavors, fear of losing our jobs if we do that. And my preaching brethren sometimes fail on that point. On occasions, close friends are involved, or it's a combination of all these. But when all our excuses are given, it doesn't change God's instructions at all. And they'll read and mean on the Day of Judgment what, how they read and mean now. We need the attitude of the Apostle Peter and the rest of the apostles who said, and they had to make the choice. 
We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 Now can anyone begin to imagine what and who all Noah and his family had to avoid to remain faithful to God? Genesis 6.9 When everybody else's mind was only on evil continually. Read Hebrews 11.7 in that great chapter on faithful men. And then realize these things were written for time for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. If any church ever had a reputation properly deserving, deserved for teaching the importance of obeying God's commandments, it has been and is the church of Christ, the kingdom of God, the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth, the temple of God, as those terms are used in the scriptures and defined. But it's one thing for the church to teach the importance of obeying God's will. It's quite another for each member to do it. And that consistently, steadfastly, and without respect of persons. To the church's shame, in general I speak, she has failed consistently and with regularity to obey God's commandments pertaining to the withdrawal of fellowship and marking of erring brethren who refuse all overtures of faithful brethren to get them to repent, as the Bible teaches. So the mark and avoid is still there. It'll be there on the day of judgment. And I must ask myself the question in the proper circumstances and situations where it's applied, will I obey it? <coughs> on the other hand, what about the people in the church who are righteous and godly, have proven through time to care for the truth more than life itself? Will I mark them and say, there's my guiding light in, among men as they've applied the truth. It won't mean they're perfect. But you know, elders themselves are taught to be examples to the flock. And when you look at the qualifications elders must meet, no wonder there'll be a pattern for the rest of the church, no matter where they are in their knowledge and practice of the truth, to look to as to how they are to do what God wants them to do. In one church where I preached many years ago, my mind was made up to leave there when one of the two elders frankly stated to his fellow elder and me that as long as he was an elder in that congregation, it would never withdraw fellowship from any member of it. Would that have made up your mind? Or would you say, well, let's just keep having these shepherds over us who don't care what goes on in the church. It's with that sad fact in mind that we close with the prayer and hope that brethren who teach the truth in this timely topic will come to genuinely from the heart practice what they preach. For faith without works is dead, being alone, James 2.17. Now I said as I decided finally this to be the one, although I wrote it years ago, that I would preach this morning, I hope you'll see that what I plan on doing this afternoon and probably next week too We'll add to this. We'll back it up. We'll lay the foundation. But if you're not a child of God this morning, you're outside of Christ. You know, you have to mark yourself if you're outside of Christ saying, I have none of the blessings. I don't even have forgiveness of sins as I now live. You need to mark yourself that I need to obey the gospel and live the rest of my life faithful to Him. Where He leads, I'll follow. We've studied what to do this morning to become a Christian. You need to do that before you leave here if you're not. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever your need in those areas, there's the solution with the determination to abide in the truth no matter what may come. If you're therefore subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing this song.